tiny in all that air. The Philip Larkin Society Podcast. Hello and welcome to Tiny in All That Air, the Philip Larkin Society Podcast and a Happy New Year to everyone. We start this year off looking at one of Philip Larkin's more unusual contemporaries, the poet, musician and teacher, Ivor Cutler. If the world of Ivor Cutler is new to you, then I hope you enjoy learning more about this unique and rather magical artist. And putting Philip Larkin and Ivor Cutler side by side certainly takes you on some interesting adventures. Joining me today is my husband, Gavin Hogg. He's a big Cutler fan and was a pen friend of Ivor's for a number of years back in the 90s. We are also joined by very special guest, writer Bruce Lindsay, whose biography of Ivor Cutler, A Life Outside the Sitting Room, has just been published by Equinox Publishing Limited, and this coincides with Ivor's centenary. Cutler and Larkin were born about five months apart from each other, and Ivor Cutler's 100th anniversary was on the 15th of January of this year. And the, the Ivor Cutler book uh, I've been working on for the last couple of years, I, I mean, I think it was wanting to know more about Ivor's life and, and starting to look online and finding very little. I mean, when I started the book, if you went to ivercutler.org, which purported to be the website for all things Cutler, it had actually been taken over by what I think was an Indonesian football fan. Um, it, I'm not sure what it looks like now, to be honest. I don't think it's that. So it was it was all very strange. And obviously there wasn't a full length biography of either. Um, he did turn down offers or requests or whatever in his life to write an autobiography. Um, and as I say in the introduction to the book, he, he wasn't fond of autobiography and he might well not have been fond of this biography either, who knows? Um, so there wasn't a full length biography. Uh, and I've been a fan of Ivor since 1971. Uh, and the sort of about 11 o'clock on uh, January the 31st or whenever it was, when I was on my way home from a Centipede gig, if you remember Centipede, this big 50 piece, jazz band and I first read one of Ivor's poems and it was a poem called Shoes um, and I didn't know who Ivor was it was in the festival program that I picked up on my way out of the concert I didn't know who he was I, I didn't know he was Scottish or Jewish or anything else I just read this little two or three line poem and I thought oh, that's quite funny and then a bit later on possibly the same year I heard him on Peel yeah um, and Ivor did more John Peel sessions um, than any other act except the fall um he did i think one fewer than the four did over the years um and so i started hearing the voice and once you've heard Ivor's voice i don't think you can separate his written words from the voice um that very distinctive kind of glasgow crossed with islay crossed with a bit of english and various other things um so he has this extremely distinctive voice, whether he's talking, narrating or singing. Um, so was that 50 year, yeah, 50 year fan worship of the man and his work. Um, but only the last two, three years, I really got to know a lot about the man behind um, the poems and the songs and the, the books and the short stories and everything else. As for Larkin, um, I don't know. When I first came across his work, I mean, I was looking at my copy of Larkin's Collected Poems, which I've got beside me, um, and that appeared, I think, 1988. So that's obviously much later than I first came across Larkin. Um, but I have to say my, my knowledge of, of Larkin, the man, and, and Larkin's poetry is, falls far short of my knowledge of, of either and his work. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, there, there are things in common. Ivor and, and Philip Larkin were born within a few months of each other. Larkin, 1922, Ivor, 1923. Obviously, they were both poets. They both loved jazz, but in different forms. Um, but after that, I think they're, they're two very diverse 
characters. Um, obviously, Larkin never set any of his poems to music, um, never played harmonium on stage, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, and yeah I, don't I don't remember that happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, he wrote one poem that was set to music, but obviously mm. he didn't set that himself, that, you know, Bridge for the Living. Mm. Um, but yeah, and I think he, he found that quite hard to do. Um, right. right. But, you know, it, it, I think, you know, it's very, very well loved as a, as a poem about, you know, the Humber Bridge. But yeah, it wasn't something that particularly made a link. Well, quite a lot of poets at those time, quite a lot of poets do it. Then, you know, like John Cooper Clark set to music, and John Betjeman had mm, a lot of yeah. poetry set to music. Yeah, I'm supposed to think when I when I look at the poets I I enjoy still now, and some of them do go back to the '60s. They tend to be what we broadly term performance poets. They're they're all almost all people who would read their work in public on the stage. Um, which again, in ways that you know, Larkin, I don't think ever attempted. You think of John Cooper Clark um, and things like post-war glamour girl and all the, the sort of stuff he, he poems he wrote that were intended to have music behind them, rather than poems, maybe in Betjeman's case, that he wrote and then had music put to them, which yeah, is a very different yeah. thing. Um, and of course, Ivor's poetry also appears as as songs, so if, as as well as just the written words. So you've got you know, Ivor's poetry books, but then you can find, you know, A Flat Man, which is one of his later books. Almost every poem in A Flat Man also appears on the LP, A Flat Man. Sometimes simply narrated, sometimes to the accompaniment of harmonium. So you, you've got that um, difference again there with Larkin. You can think of you know, sort of Linton Quessy Johnson, who I, I love. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. His yeah. work in the 70s, like uh, Forces of Victory, with that really heavy reggae um, track underneath them. I mean, they, they're quite, they, that gives them a certain quality, which I, I enjoy more, I think, than reading poetry off the written page. So if you, yeah, haven't, yeah. If you haven't recorded your work, um, maybe I, I don't give it the attention it deserves, perhaps. That's really interesting you bring up Linton Quasi Johnson. I've seen him live a couple of times and, and the music just brings like, an amazing like dimension to the, the sound of, his, you know, his voice. Mm. Um, and it works very naturally. I think Larkin, like we know that Larkin didn't really enjoy public appearances because he was quite a little bit self-conscious about a stutter that he had, mm. he'd had all his life. Mm. Um, you know, poor hearing, for example. It's just quite mm. difficult for him to be in public, I think, mm. for very mm. human reasons, you know, I think reasons yeah, yeah. we could all understand. Um, and he uh, said that he liked to, he, he saw his poems as mo more naturally on the page, mm. that you would get more from a Larkin poem by just sitting and reading it to yourself than reading it out loud. He wasn't too concerned about the quality of how it sounded read out loud. But I think you're right. I mean, we've been reading Ivor Cutler poems to each other. Gal's quite good at accents. I'm not. But I do find myself <laughs> going into a bit of a Scottish accent, don't know, when I'm reading. Yeah. Like, you just go into the rhythm of it. Well, yeah, I think it's like Bruce said, once you've heard Ivor's voice, it's such a characteristic and beautiful and slightly melancholic, but there's like, there's a humour at the edges of it as yeah. well. And, yeah. and, and you just don't forget it. And, and then that voice is just always in your head. Whereas Larkin, although he had a distinctive voice, you don't hear it as much and it's it's not as distinctive no. as you know as, as Ivor or mm. you know John Definitely Cooper not. Clark again with the John Cooper Clark poem when you read it you kind of have that sulfur nasal yeah. kind of northwest yeah. voice yeah. in your head as well yeah. and you don't and you don't get that with Larkin either because we've not heard it as much uh, and also and it's not as distinctive I think no I think it's kind of distinctive for us only because it's that BBC accent isn't it that he's got that you don't hear very much so have you have you heard the Sunday sessions, Bruce? I presume have you heard Larkin the so the few recordings of Larkin reading his not re well, I say not recently. I I had a long time ago and I did watch there were two or three programmes on BBC last yeah. year which I watched and sort of reminded me a bit about Larkin the, the man rather than Larkin's work as well. But it yes, I mean I think Ivor was concerned actually, he did say in a couple of interviews, he was concerned about what would happen after his death? Would the poems stand stand up without the voice? Now, obviously, the voice is there. It's on that record. It's on CD. It's on um, movie clips. But I, I think he became a little concerned that so much of his work. I can't say, as I say, I can't read Ivor's work without he hearing Ivor's yeah. voice. Mm. 
Um, whether that's something to do with my own Scottish background, which is you know slightly different, it's Edinburgh and Lowland Scottish. But he does use a lot of Scottish dialect, a lot of yeah. Scottish words and terms in his in his work as well that he, he picked up. We were talking about the word buffet mm. as a as a Scottish word. Yes. Um, which obviously, as an you know, if you're not being switched on to being Scottish dialect, you think, why is he talking about a buffet? Yeah. You know? Yes. Um, but it's a completely different thing, and it's a lovely it's a lovely word, a sort of it gentle. Dumb. <laughs> gentle <laughs> buffet. <laughs> Oh, buffet, buffet is a great word. Yeah, it's a lovely word. It's very, yeah, it's, it's very descriptive of the act yeah, think, yeah, as well. But I mean, I've done that in the past. I remember years ago, I, I interviewed a, a couple of guys from a band. They got a new album, out, uh, an instrumental album. I said, well, why, why have you called this track Munch? Because it's quite a beautiful, intriguing track. And it just says it's just called Munch. And there was a pause. And, the, and one of the guys, the guitarist, I think, said, it's actually Monk. It's about the painter. Oh, <laughs> 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 that's the trouble with instrumentals if you don't actually say something in the lyrics yeah i think i think they're to blame there <laughs> oh i know what i was going to say it's interesting you saying that you you came across uh, Ivor cutler through the peel sessions back in the early 70s i came across Ivor cutler through the peel sessions like in the late 80s right it, it, and and again and i kind of forgotten about him a little bit but then when my my kids were little um they played um, a bit of Ivor Cutler on Six Music. Mm. Uh, it might have been Mark Lamar. Uh, Mark Lamar. Steve Lamack. Sorry, it <laughs> might have been Mark Lamar. <laughs> but been. I think it was Steve Lamack. <laughs> and, the, and the kids were really kind of like, just so taken aback by it. And they they seen poetry readings and stuff like that. Mm. You know, they, they were familiar with Six Music and a bit of sort of alternative music and whatever. But it's like there's nothing like hearing an Ivor Cutler for the first mm. time. And uh, it, it really, I don't think they even really liked it that much, but they were certainly yeah. intrigued. Mm. And, um, you know, when you when you hear an Ivor Cutler poem, you don't really know anything much about it. You just hear such a unique voice, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, they were when we were getting in touch about this, you were talking about Larkin's way of working and how it's all sort of meticulously laid out in, in the archive. Um, and I think Ivor generally had much the opposite way of working in some respects, in that he talks quite often about his approach to writing, whether it's poems or lyrics, and, and tending to do it early in the morning, sitting in bed when the fridge or the wind has woken him up. And I don't think there was much editing after the event, although I've no proof of that. Um, and I, there is no publicly accessible Ivor Cutler archive like there would be to, for a, yeah. a working archive of, of books and things. Um, that's still within the family. But I get the impression, on the one hand, he didn't do much sort of post-processing, as it were, much mm. editing and revising. But on the other hand, when you talk to people who worked with him on his records, um, he was very strict about how his work was recorded. And he, did, he gave very little leeway to producers to say, oh, well, we'll, we'll put four bars of instrumental in here or, or we'll... Um, you know, we'll repeat this line twice, or why don't you start on verse two rather? But he wouldn't do that. He was very, mm. it reminds me of Samuel Beckett in that respect. In mm. that Beckett was very, very strict about there's a pause here and it lasts one second, not one and a half seconds, not two seconds. And you don't pause there, you go straight through, and that's not a full stop, that's a comma. Um, so although the work looks like it comes fully, you know, almost stream of consciousness, he seemed like, well, that's it, I've done that, that's, that's how it is. Yeah, and that's how it will stay. Yeah, um, and if there are notebooks full of crossings out and, and uh, reworkings, and I don't know of them. You, you talk in the book about him trying to sort of bypass the intellect, yeah, don't you, and just tap into that consciousness, which I guess is pretty much the opposite to the way that Larkin would have approached mm. his poetry, with lots of redrafting and trying to find the the perfect word. And, yeah, because you know, I mean his rhyme schemes are very complex, and they they put a lot of restrictions on choice of vocabulary and and yet he works sort of meticulously within those restrictions that he's put on himself you know and mm. and and form for for Larkin you know he's a highly sort of formal writer in a lot in a lot of his poems and that's what he enjoyed he you know he he kind of railed against the kind of free verse style of writing that writers like T.S. Eliot and modernist writers you know maybe mm. writers like yeah. uh, like uh, Eliot and Pound who were sort of breaking out of that those restrictions, which was an important literary movement. Um, but, it, you know, Larkin went back to people like Yates and Hardy and, and went back mm. to the, those kind of um, more restrained kind of 
you know, forms of poetry, um, which which gives it, you know, the beauty and the sort of tension in the poetry that you get. But it's just, two, yeah, two really different ways of, of writing. And as you say, there's enough evidence to say that Ivor might have written a particular poem in five minutes at three o'clock in the morning, but that's how it stayed and he wouldn't mm. let anybody change that. Mm. Um, uh, I like um, the descriptions of Ivor offering poetry writing sessions to people and he was always very disappointed if they, they kind of went a bit Keatsian or yes. tried to write a sonny or something. Yeah, <laughs> not what yeah. he wanted. <laughs> no, I mean, it's this, the, the Cutler method, uh, yeah. as he called it, was centred on bypassing the intellect, yeah. letting the words flow. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting that according to Ivor, he didn't, and I know Philip Larkin was writing poems, kind of as a teenager, um, yeah. and at Oxford. Ivor claims he didn't start writing until much later, so probably 20 years after that. Um, although Ivor's stories often vary in the telling. Sometimes probably it's just memory fading. Sometimes I think it's mischievousness on his part. But he, he was quite, although the dates vary a little bit, he, he does talk about not writing poetry until the mid-late 60s, the earliest, so he would be coming up, you know, he would have been in his 40s when he started, mm. when he claimed to have started writing poems, as opposed to song lyrics, which he was writing much earlier. He was writing those in the 1950s when he was mm. barely into his 30s and possibly before that. And he did make that distinction between poetry and, and lyrics. And song yeah. lyrics. Um, but the Cutler Method, he taught to an, an array of people. Um, he did it quite late on. It was after he'd given up his, his, his life as a school teacher. Um, and he used to teach people at the South Bank in London, which has the Poetry uh, Society Library in it. Yeah. He would go up there sometimes or he would take people to different bits, the quiet areas of the library. He would have of the, the South Bank Centre, he would have people around his flat um, and do his best to teach them to approach poetry, say, as almost stream of consciousness. Which I think is interesting. Van Morrison was a fan of Ivor Cutler. I don't know if there's a... Oh, a link right. to the way a lot of Van Morrison's lyrics seem mm. as well. Um, and he used to get quite irate. There were a few people he'd started to look, to teach poetry. So, no, you, you, your, your mind is too closed. Your mind is too, yeah. as you say, too sort of cute, you know, too, too much geared towards the old romantic poets. Yeah. So I don't think I could do anything with you. And other <laughs> people couldn't do anything with the, with the Cutler method. <laughs> but he had a, a strange attitude. Well, strange, he had a very distinct attitude to to poets and that generally he hated them all. Sometimes he loved them for a while and then he went off them for no apparent reason. He didn't like British poets. Mm. I've not come across any specific reference to Larkin. No. I did say on a number of occasions that he didn't feel British poets were doing anything worthwhile. Whether this was, I'm just trying to remember the chronology. I think this is probably after Larkin's death. Because I've you know, lived into his eighties. Yeah, but he was quite strange. You know, he, he really enjoyed people, and then he would think, no, no, no. He did that with painters as well. Um, mm. Oh, I really love that. Oh no, no, I don't. Oh yes, I do. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes that was just a bit of devilment in him yeah. as well. Sometimes it was longer term, but he tended to see himself a little bit, as a lot of other people see him, as an outsider. Yeah, so I mean, I, I the total body of published work also, I think, exceeds Larkin's by quite a long way, just as the poems. I, I'm, you know, the collected works, I know it's not absolutely everything, but how many poems are in the collected works? Oh, in so Larkin's collected works. About two, 250, 300. Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah, probably at least double that. Yeah. Well, I was to say some of those poems are also also appear uh, could, be, could be considered to be song lyrics. Yeah. Um, of course, Larkin was... wrote two novels, two completed novels, and mm. um, all his prose, all his jazz, you know, and and yes, uh, his literary criticism. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not a huge body of work at all. Mm. I mean, I, I'm just wondering whether Ivor's editors were a bit freer than Larkin's editors in terms of what they published, which mm. may also... Mm. Although I know the at least one of his editors towards the end of his life would, would turn down stuff quite often because it wasn't up to par. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I've, Ivor, as you say, Larkin wrote novels, which Ivor didn't do, but he did write two collections of short stories and he wrote a lot of uh, newspaper articles for our papers like The New Statesman or... Um, Scotland on Sunday uh, and various others. 
and the, uh, chil and the children's books as well. And the children's books, mm. which there are quite a few of. Um, and I think there's about 15 books of poetry altogether, although a yeah. couple of those are collected yeah. from earlier works. Um, but I, it, I think there's such a large body of work that maybe the, the quality control isn't what it might have been. Mm. I do some, and I still sometimes can just pick up a book and flick through it and read something and think, mm, mm, all right. No idea what that was about. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, another contrast with Larkin is that if I ever get beyond about 15 lines, that's long. Yeah. A lot of Ibers' work is, is much shorter. It's sort of seven or eight lines. Yeah. And they're often published in paragraph form. I've just got yeah. the one I've got here is is that your flapjack. Um, and some of them are, are written down as you might expect poems to be written down. So lines are separated and verses are separated but a lot of them they're just even quite long ones and there's one here called your hour has come which is just a single paragraph do you want do you um, want to pick one to read out we've not heard we've not heard any either yet not no. heard any either i'm not going to attempt an accent <laughs> um but i do tend to slip it's this weird thing because i'm you know the nearer i get to the scottish border when i'm going north the, the, the accent changes and and uh the same applies when reading Ivor, so if I do it, yeah. I'm going to read Cyclist. It's quite short. Yeah. Um, and it does touch on one of Ivor's major pastimes, which he also shared with Larkin, and that's riding a bike. Yeah. Um, and also possibly with Death, which is another interest. Yes. Different yeah. way. So this is just called Cyclist. Every time I get killed by a motor vehicle, God hands me a fresh life. I want to see how long it takes you to learn sense and leave the road to these mad buggers. I suck a rescue remedy pill from Goulds and Crowndale Road and wobble home. I bet it's because I go around saying that religion is irrelevant to my life. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I'm reading that out loud just now. It actually touches on a whole host of things that was central to Ivor's life and that do have that coverage with Philip. He did cycle. He cycled pretty much into his early 80s. Um, he did talk about, write about religion quite a lot. Um, he had at least two crashes on his bicycle when he was hit or almost hit by cars. Yeah, because he was cycling in London. Cycling in more dangerous. Not, not in, no, not in, yes, more dangerous than Larkin's territory. Yeah. He was very fond of rescue remedy pills. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he did, you know, in terms of religion, although he wrote about it, he, he did say he sort of lost any religious beliefs and feelings quite early on. So they constantly come back. But he did talk about death a lot. Yeah. And the sense I get from reading Larkin when he touches on death is a fear of death. Either I don't get the fear of death. Um, Ivor's big fear was the fear of losing his mental capacity yeah and he did actually say more than one occasion things to the to the effect of you know death is a good friend to me yeah um and he was yeah, he did quite often talk about suicide and death didn't he quite quite he, casually yeah. and quite regularly and he was a, a genuine long-term supporter of the uh, euthanasia society or, yeah. or whatever names it went under when he was um alive and he, yes there's a lot of and a remarkable amount of sudden death in his poems and songs sometimes it's birds and animals but often it's people as well as quite a few people need a sticky end in Ivor's poetry yeah yeah death and random acts of violence <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 um, I mean that is a, the polar opposite of Larkin I mean Larkin was consumed by the a horror of death and a, mm. a huge fear of death um and it and it was quite psychologically overwhelming for him because he didn't have the relief of religion either. No. Um, and I think, you know, from his sort of, well, as well as I was, you know, um, people born in the 1920s, religion was a, a more everyday part of people's lives, wasn't it? You know, and <laughs> yeah. um, was seen as like a, a more sort of standard answer to the, the question, like, what happens when we die? But, you know, Larkin had, had put all that behind him. He loved churches. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I like this. I like that you pick cycling because it and we we're talking, you know, talking about um, kind of existential type poetry because it makes me think of um, you know church going and mm -hmm. that's and that's Larkin cycling to a church 
and going to look into the church, not because he was got any kind of religious movement, but he's just interested in, in, in what it does for us, really, what religion does for us, what it offers us. Um, uh, I, does, does Ivor really write so much about religion per se? He, not so much in his work, but he does, he does talk a little bit about religion. Ivor's experience of religion as, as a child was, again, very different to Larkin's, from what I'm aware. Because Larkin came from quite a well-to-do background, I think, um, and was a Christian in a Christian society. Yeah. Um, Ivor grew up in Govan, in Glasgow, and in his early life, the family were quite poor, although they later became quite his father became quite successful and he moved out to the suburbs and had a big house on uh, uh, 29 Redburn Avenue, as Ivor tells us in one of his poems, uh, which is about a car crash in which somebody dies. Um, but Ivor grew up in, a, in Govan as a young child of Jewish immigrants who'd arrived at the end of the 19th century um, in a community that was also filled with Protestants and Catholics. And so I grew up in a, a world in which violence was quite com was common and often justified from a religious perspective. Mm, yeah. yeah. Protestants and Catholics both hated the Jews. Catholics hated the Protestants. The Jews hated the Catholics and the Protestants. And gangs were built along religious lines. Football, Celtic and Rangers built along religious lines. Um, Either though Jewish went to a, a school that was predominantly um, non-Jewish, predominantly mm. a Christian in, in name at least, and, and met anti-Semitism from pupils and from teachers. Yeah. Um, so his experiences were, were very, very different. So his attitude, I think, um, grew out of that. Um, and he, you know, he doesn't write about visiting synagogues or churches and. and reveling in the, the architectural beauty of something like that he tends not to no. touch on those but he, he writes about religion in many forms philosophy religion belief um in many forms that he, he touches on but perhaps not as centrally as maybe Larkin I think one thing they, they both share uh, in terms of the childhood is being quite sensitive Obviously, they were both poets, but, you know, both very sensitive souls. And you get the feeling with uh, Ivor, certainly, that he he felt he was always kind of overlooked and misunderstood and not really valued um, as a child. And that kind of lived with him all his life, mm. didn't it? He, he never really managed to let go of that. No. And, and then, in, in, you know, his collection of um, the Life in the Scotch Sitting Room, Volume 2 stories, mm. which are an exaggerated for comic effect kind of um recounting of his of his childhood in a in a way and there's certainly elements of truth in it um but there's always quite a, a sadness at the heart of all of those stories isn't there even though they're, they're, there's a lot of laughs in them and, and mm. there's you know some some really funny moments but uh he you always get the idea that he was uh a sad child and that that, that carried on sort of throughout his adulthood yeah. he never got over it no <laughs> yeah larkin wasn't he wasn't particularly bullied, I don't think, and he certainly didn't grow up in a in a phys, you know any kind of physical punishment or anything like that. It was a nice middle class family. There's there is sometimes a bit of an overgeneralisation that the parents were kind of very cold and it was a horrible childhood, but it, it was. I think we've got enough evidence that it actually wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I think again, just a very very sensitive, very shy child who picked up on tensions between the parents and and that a very formal sort of household where everything had its place everything was very neat and tidy and you didn't you know he, he um you couldn't just sort of run around as a young boy creating a, a mess and having fun um and going on adventures it wasn't that kind of world that he grew up in and then of course he he had that um relationship with his mother who lived a very long life and he spent all you know all most of his life until obviously until she died trying to look after her feeling guilty about not looking after her enough or not yeah. taking enough care of her i was just looking at one of his letters that he wrote to um monica you know his long-term mm. partner in 1954 and he says if if one starts blaming one one's parents well one would never stop yeah. you know and and anyone who was still worrying about his parents at 35 was a fool i, th I think the influence but i think the influence they exert is enormous
And uh, the famous line from Larkin, I never remember my parents making a single spontaneous gesture of affection towards each other. Mm. Um, so, you know, not an abusive household, but a household that as a, as a sensitive boy had a big impact on him. A sleepy old snake lies behind your eyes And when I look in your eyes to tell you I love you The sleepy old snake lifts its sleepy old head And gives me a sleepy old smile became a teacher after the war when there was a desperate shortage of teachers mm. and there was a lot of uh, encouragement of ex-forces personnel to go into into teaching so he he probably went in voluntarily as it were rather than feeling forced into it but that was not until say after the war so he's in his early 20s when he trained started to training as a teacher having spent the war first in the RAF in this rather bizarre um episode of his life when he trained to be a navigator yeah um, which was difficult to get to the bottom of. Um, so again, very different war to Larkin's war. Yeah, of course, yeah, um, because Larkin was at Oxford, and uh, although a lot of his contemporaries did go to fight and had to finish their mm. studies early, um, yeah, he wasn't physically fit enough yeah. for that. So again, uh, I think he, that, he, sorry, I was going to say it's an, I think an important part of you know it says quite a lot of our either's character and personality that he volunteered. Um, yeah. he joined up voluntarily he wasn't conscripted um, partly I think because there was a, a body of thought in the country that the Jews we use that term in sort of as it was used at the time the Jews weren't doing their bit mm. despite mm. the fact that you know what was coming out of Europe the mm. Jews were not doing their bit and in fact um, I've said you know he saw a newspaper article it said um something about a conscientious objector who was Jewish. And, and I said, oh, I knew what that was all about. Yeah, yeah. But uh, in fact, a lot of um, Jewish people did sign up in the war, but they didn't declare themselves as Jewish because if they were caught by the Germans, they would have been treated probably far worse than, than yeah. the standard prisoner of war. Um, Ivor's RAF career didn't work out because, probably because somebody had the daft idea of thinking make a good navigator. Um, and he was dismissed. The story variously, got, you know, says he was dismissed for dreaminess, or dismissed for not plotting courses correctly, or for spending too much time looking at the clouds. <laughs> um, I don't think we'll ever quite get to the bottom of why he was dismissed. I mean, even Dan, his younger son, says it, you know the family were never quite sure of what went on. But he he um, came back to Glasgow and, and spent the rest of the war working in uh, factories that were working for the war effort. Because um, he had started as an engineering apprentice, um, so he did have that background and, and worked for Rolls Royce, and then he worked for, for other comp companies after the war. Then became a teacher. Um, and whereas Larkin was obviously in higher education for much of his working life as a librarian, yeah, I've spent most of his working life in primary education, yeah, and developed this theory which I, I love, um, which is that the younger the age group you teach, the higher you should be paid. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as a as a, an ex university academic myself, I mean, on one level, I hardly disagree, um, but on another <laughs> level, I I would have not known what to do with a yeah room full of thirty five year olds. Um, so hats off to the man. He was apparently a very good, very interesting, and very enjoyable teacher throughout his career. Yeah, I think it would have been lovely to be taught by Ivor and very creative teacher. And he had that real um, like affinity with children, doesn't he? He says at one point in your book, he actually says, I am a child. And he mm. kind of sees that side of him. Um, Larkin was the organiser, the archiver. I think that's why he, he kind of fell into librarianship because there was obviously a lot of pressure on him to take up a job. Mm. Um, he was getting letters, you know, from the, I don't know, like the home, home office or whatever after he graduated to say, are you working now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Yes. Larkin? Um, but, you know, clearly it became something he was incredibly gifted at and, you know, became right at the height of his profession at the end. Yeah. Um, and, but, yeah, I think 
there's there's a, a an argument that you can see it in his poetry that he, it's it's about organization it's about structure mm. and form and um, which is what he did brilliantly in his librarianship as you know as well as in his his poetry um mm. but but uh Ivor had that creativity in a, expressed in a very different way yeah. what a, were you gonna... a good example oh, well i was going to say um you know i had a correspondence with Ivor for, for around about 10 years yeah, yeah. and uh, i went out to teach english in in Italy in um, 1999 and I sent a letter to Ivor and, and explained I was I was going away for a while and uh, he sent me a, a lovely little thing in, in the post which I still have which was uh, an envelope that he'd, he'd written on it teaching aids it went, and it was for, for when I went to Italy and it was just full of li his little stickies that mm. he, he used his little sticky labels uh, and one of them was uh, fly sandwich which is the, the title of one of his books but it's also a very short um, poem a fly crouching in a sandwich cannot comprehend why it has become more than ordinarily vulnerable and I always like to think that <laughs> when, I, when I went to Italy and I was working with kids and, and adults uh, in sort of mountain villages up in the Dolomites and just how baffled they would have been by me you know <laughs> using these stickers with them to try and explain English but I think that kind of that idea must have appealed to Ivor's sense of mischievousness and yeah. uh, and it's you know quite sort of progressive teaching. <laughs> <laughs> the the stickies are again for for people who are not aware of another branch of Ivor's literary output was stickies, and they are about what half the size of a bank card generally. Hmm. Little small sticky labels, normally white background, black text. Sometimes they were gold background, um, and predominantly they had these phrases like like you've just said. Um, just little short phrases, one sentence or one yeah. phrase. Made of and dust. Made of dust, yeah. Made I've got dust. one of those on my laptop. <laughs> slightly slightly imperfect. You are remove. beautiful, is one. You are You're beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Or I am beautiful, I think, actually. I am beautiful. Hand stickers out. Um, to remove this label, take it off. <laughs> um, and my particular favourite is, don't you dare tell me what kind of day to have. <laughs> um, That's very colour, isn't it? Yeah. It's very, very colour, all these modern American customer facing. <laughs> um, but he used those at school. The, the, the ex pupils I spoke to said he, he, he would bring stickies to school and, and give them out to the pupils. He would stick them on, on lampposts and plate, you know, at random around Camden and, and other areas of London. And sometimes he would take great care to give a particular sticky to a particular person mm. as well. And the, the I'm beautiful one, there's a story that one of his friends told me. Uh, they were both waiting for a bus one day and um, everybody else in the queue was was uh, elderly, shall we say, and grumbling because the bus was late. And when they got on, they all basically accused the bus drivers that it was his fault and were not polite or happy. And the bus driver was looking worse and worse. It was a really hot, muggy day. Oh. And the driver was just looking more and more down. And Ivor got on, got his ticket, and popped a little sticker on the, the bus driver that just said, I'm beautiful. And oh. the person was with Ivor said, so the guy's face just lit up. And it was oh. like, somebody appreciated Yes, somebody yeah. appreciated me. Forget all that lot. This strange looking man with the little glasses and the funny hat has just given me this and it's, yeah, I'm beautiful. So um, the stickies, I think, were more important than most people think. They th you know, I think he, he took great pains in choosing the phrases. They weren't all his. Sometimes he, he would quote um, other people, but they were predominantly his. He would take great pains at deciding who to give them to in many cases mm. as well. And they meant something. Um, he, you know, if you have given a particular sticky... He would walk around the South Bank Centre putting on people's hats when they went to the toilets when they came back. <laughs> this weird phrase stuck on it. Um, and yeah, I mean, they were so popular, there was actually a book of, of Ivor's sticky, uh, stickies published um, in one of the latter publications that Ivor produced. And I think that. Friend the Bacterium. They're, yes, yeah, the Friend the Bacterium, because he, he was, you know, title of one of his songs I believe in bugs, I truly believe in bugs. He liked bugs. I mean, that's, <laughs> that song yeah. is also, also about death because he talks about bugs eating him away when he's in his coffin. Um, but it's a very cheery, upbeat song, and it is a song, very definitely. It's, you know, I, very, I believe in bugs. I truly believe in bugs. I believe in bugs. I truly believe in bugs. 
So it's a very jolly. You can see children sitting in a semicircle in Ivers, Mr. Cutler, sorry, classroom. Yeah. Um, singing along. And, you know, Mud, which is another very popular Ivers song that first saw the light of day at school and uh, past the ball gym, which is about playing football. Um, ex pupils remember that sort of being inspired by him watching the children playing in the playground as well. Of course, so all... of course we re really should be calling him Mr. Cutler, shouldn't we? Yeah, I <laughs> really preferred to be Mr. Cutler, I think. I, I sweated blood over that. And again, it's, it's in the introduction to the book. I, I decided we never met. I never even saw him live. And there's lots of people said to me, the, you know, if you didn't call him Mr. Cutler on first meeting, he genuinely got cross. He really yeah. didn't like it. So you call him Mr. Cutler, and then maybe later, if you got to know him well, you could call him either. Um, and I felt I got to know him well, as, as any biographer can really get to know somebody well who they've never met. Um, so I made the decision in the book, if I'm talking about him as a teacher, he's Mr. Cutler. If I'm talking about him in any other context, he's either. Mm. Hopefully, he'll be all right with that. Um, was Larkin as formal as that, or I know there's a nice example with his letters to Barbara Pym, because he he started the correspondence because basically he was such a fan, and obviously he he addressed the letters to Miss Pym and she wrote back to Mr. Larkin, um, but they they realised a friendship was forming, and um, eventually, uh, I think he asks her permission. To, to address it, dear Barbara. Babs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because Babs in the end. Um, and uh, I, I think that's really lovely. You know, they had a, a very, a very sort of gentle friendship, and and you know, respected each other very mm -hmm. much. And uh, yeah, I don't. I, I'm sure he would have preferred Mr. Larkin most of the time mm. to you know Phil. <laughs> well, Phil. I don't know if anyone called him Phil. <laughs> yeah. I was sort of thinking, like, we know that um, then they're not like, the Philip Larkin Society. Is one of our charitable aims is to um, sort of promote the knowledge and understanding of Larkin and his contemporaries. Right. Um, and when we when we've talked about the word contemporaries, um, we we've really kind of focused on writers that had um, a a direct kind of relationship with Larkin or. Um, Larkin considered a, a friend or an influence or mm. a peer in mm. some way. So we, we've looked at people like Kingsley Amis or, um, you know, Ted Hughes, maybe Sylvia Plath, Barbara Pym, etc. Um, obviously, we know there's no reference to, to Ira Cutler in any of anything that we've got of Larkin that we can find. There's no reference right. to Larkin in anything that Cutler did. We know, like, politically, the opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, mm. Larkin mm. was kind of quite conservative, but right wing. Uh, Colour was very much very progressive, left wing, yeah. uh, green, you know, feminist yeah. and that kind of yeah. stuff. Lots of lots of contrast between them. Um, and so I did get a little bit of like, well, why why would we even compare Ivor Cutler and Philip Larkin? But I do think it's really useful to sort of it's another way of reframing each of their their contribution to sort of literature isn't it really mm. and you know they lived in in lots of ways in quite a similar world in terms of the goons and spike milligan and the english eccentric and the jazz and, and what you did with yourself after the war the trauma of world war ii mm. and living through that i do think there's a lot to be said for for looking at people side by side but i was also trying to think like could we find like kind of connections in their work so when i was looking through the i have a couple of books and obviously i i I'm not an Ivor Cutler expert like like you two are. Um, so I was coming to this all probably for the first time. The first one I picked out was Giant because it really reminded me of uh, Old Bard. And, and I think Cutler struggled to, to sleep a little bit, didn't he? He had those he kind of, he was up at night, but he was sort of using it quite productively. Whereas L Larkin's difficulty with sleeping, I think he really struggled with and found it that, you know, it was, it just made him think of death, really. <laughs> just not what you want at three o'clock no. in the morning. But I'll just read Giant, if that's okay. Mm. Giant. I can't sleep, Jean. The old man, a giant in woolen underwear, rose and staggered deliberately to the kitchen via the bathroom. He returned with a packet of thin arrowroot biscuits, a bottle of milk, two Granny Smiths, two Satsumas, a handful of dried apricots, a handful of mocha chocolate beans and a banana. 
he swallowed with gusto and lay back. Jean followed suit with a huge bowl of porridge. Then they did the crossword, waiting for the dawn, smiling and moving about. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was just so different from <laughs> Obard, where, you know, you're, you're uh, waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. Mm -hmm. In time, the curtain edges will grow light. Till then, I see what's really always there. Unresting death, a whole day nearer now. And I mean, you know, for many people, it's it's Larkin's most powerful poem. But you kind of say maybe you needed to go downstairs and get a handful of apricots yeah. and a bowl of porridge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I speak say as though waking in the middle of the night was a regular occurrence for him. He say sometimes he blames the fridge, sometimes he blames the wind, um, sometimes I guess it was just spontaneous. But he did have difficulty. He, he couldn't sleep in hotels from relatively no. early on. Uh, I think really by sort of mid seventies, he was struggling to to sleep in a bed other than his own. Um, and before too long, his his touring, his performing, he pretty much kept within striking distance of his flat in London, yeah. so to be back every night. Yeah. Um, he, he didn't like strange beds. He didn't like air conditioning. He didn't like Muzak. Um, he didn't like noises he was unfamiliar with. Um, yeah. So he did struggle to do that, and that I think is one reason. He, I mean, he, he did occasionally get persuaded into uh, performing back up in Scotland or, or in the north of England, but it became much much rarer by by that time, and he preferred to stay nearer home. But he's as, yeah, as we said earlier, waking in the middle of the night held no terrors for either. It yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. The, the notebook and the pencil were by his bed. Yeah, and um, he could crack on. Yeah. Yeah, um, we were rereading Mr. Bleeny and uh, we, we kind of felt there was quite an Ivor Cutler, quite yeah, a few Ivor Cutler. Yeah, it was me about Ivor Cutler in a, in a way, you know, a rented room and, and stuffing cotton wool in his ears to drown out the sound of the TV. It really reminded me of, <laughs> oh, sorry, radio. Yeah, the, yeah. Jab, the radio. jabbering set. And I mean, Cutler really hated that kind of intrusive yeah. noise, didn't he? And he was a member of the noise of bank. That. We've got the dog in the background, yeah. <laughs> that intrusive noise. Um, yes. But yeah, stuff in my ears with cotton wool. Um, and, and Larkin often complained about the noise from neighbours in, in the flat in Pearson Park. And mm -hmm. of course, they had that in common as well, didn't they? Um, Laurier Road and Pearson Park just had, they were essential parts of, of who they were. Yeah. And, uh, Ivor Cutler never left the flat, did he, until he had to go into kind of nursing care. No, he didn't. He moved in in the early 60s and didn't leave until he was taken to hospital. Yeah. Um, and then from hospital to, to a nursing care home. Yeah. Uh, where he stayed uh, until he died. So he, he had a, a almost 40 years in that flat in Laurier Road. <laughs> We haven't touched on jazz yet, but that was probably the almost the, the common, the most common thread between the two men. Yeah. Um, was their love of jazz. Although looking at what Larkin wrote and looking at what Ivor wrote and, and listened to the, the the overlap is very is very thin, I think. Yeah. The great, the great expanse, the great continuum of jazz, but Ivor and, and Larkin, I think, would have overlapped. Yeah, they're, they're kind of at opposite ends, aren't they, really? Mm -hmm. Um I think Ivor's much keener on sort of later jazz, isn't he, and, and more kind of free form sort of yeah. expressions of jazz, whereas um, Larkin's more the blues, on, the blues and the, and the um, Orleans New Orleans, sort of style. yeah, yeah. It's I find it difficult to tease out with Larkin exactly what he felt about the modernists, um, because a lot of people just say, "Well, he just hated them all," and then you read things where he says something quite nice about that Miles Davis or Charlie Parker and then other people say oh yeah but he was actually just being satirical and, he's, and I yeah, don't know yeah. you, you probably know far more about him than me but what strikes me with Larkin is that when he was reviewing for the Telegraph I think maybe he wrote about things he was forced to listen to mm. um, 
which as a, as a music reviewer myself does, does happen sometimes. Mm. Oliver was never forced to listen to anything. Um, but he, it seems to me that he was more genuinely open to things. He started listening to jazz well before World War II. Um, but he, his tastes were developing. You know, he, he was listening. He loved Thelonious Monk. He loved Lenny Tristano. He loved all these sort of later period. He loved the sort of jazzy things that people like Robert Wyatt were producing. Uh, and in fact, you know, made one of his rare collaborative appearances with Robert Wyatt and one of his, you know, one of only two, a very small handful um, was Neil Ardley, um, a jazz composer and, and musician. He appeared on one of Neil Ardley's albums uh, reciting... Um, Gone with the Luminous Nose. Gone with the Luminous Nose, thank you. And, yes, <laughs> reciting Gone with the Luminous Nose. Um, I never did get to the bottom of the story as to why that happened. Um, but I think I was more open. Um, probably the, the, the circles they moved in were different. Yeah. You know, I don't I don't know if Philip Larkin was moving in the sort of circle that was listening to Centipede or Freeform Jazz no. um, or, you know, hard rock or um, punk. But, but either was. Um, and, and Larkin's like young adulthood, his teenage and, and his time at um, Oxford University, it just um, it was infused with listening to jazz, jazz records. Mm. And when he got to Oxford, you know, he he made friends with other people that um, other other undergraduates who also loved jazz, you know, and they were sharing their records and discovering, you know, all, all the different, you know, like King Oliver and mm -hmm. uh, all these different kind of Count Basie and Big Spiderbeck and Sidney Bechet, et cetera. And, you know, Kingsley Amis loved it. And so it's it's inevitable that, that those musicians and those records just is they're Larkin's safe place, aren't they? They're they're mm. you know for a lot of us, music that we listen to in our teens and early twenties. I mean, I'm I'm sitting here looking at a poster of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Right. I, you know, I've been listening to Nick Cave since 1986 or something since mm. I was a teenager. Um, you know, like the Fall or whatever. They're just it, it's quite you. It's not unusual for for us as human beings to not be very progressive <laughs> <laughs> and to kind of go with what we know and what we love. And I think Larkin did did do that, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I think it's interesting that a lot of the music Larkin listened to was already old when he started listening to yeah. it. King yeah. Oliver, you know, and the early Louis Armstrong sides um, were already, you know, a decade or so or more old. Yeah. Um, I think either... Ivory initially was into folk music, bagpipes he loved, and classical music, and came to jazz a little later on, possibly because of his time in the RAF, when you know his, his fellow RAF recruits would bash out jazz tunes on the pianos in the naffies, or they would play mm. jazz records. But the, the first one he really talks about as, as loving, um, he bought, I think after the war, and it was Albert Ammons, the, the boogie woogie pianist, and again, one of the few people I think who's on the Larkins Jazz compilation mm. who I can also trace back to Ivor saying, I love mm. this record. And he loved Albert Ammons and he loved Albert Ammons all of his life. He was still talking, you know, very fondly of Ammons' work um, when he was, uh, you know, into this century when he was producing, putting compilations together for the BBC or for um, the record label. Um, but he did, as I say, his mind was more open to other stuff, possibly because that's the circuit he moved. And of course, Ivor was more of a musician than Larkin. I think Larkin yeah. tried to play the drums and, and didn't really make it. Yes. Ivor did actually move in the circle of living, breathing, performing jazz musicians. Yeah. Um, which again, I don't think Larkin had anything like that exposure. No. He, you know, Ivor would, was in London, so he was visiting jazz clubs quite regularly. And then he made this famous or famously forgotten appearance on Late Night Lineup um, in a jazz trio. Mm. Um, trio, which uh, I think he called the Three Wise Men. And they performed once and once only. And that was to be recorded for, for Late Night Lineup. So they spent a couple of hours playing together in the afternoon. The, the performance was recorded and broadcast that night. Um, and that was the that was the end of the Three Wise Men as a jazz. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, Ivor and the drummer Trevor Com Tompkins, Trevor did join Ivor and Jill Lyons, the bass player, 
for Ivor's Ludo album, the one produced by George Martin. But that trio, which featured Dave Green on, on bass, mm. um, that was the only time I ever played. And it's when you watch it, and I don't know if I ever showed it you, Gavin. Yeah, you yeah, sent, we you sent it to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, you, know, you can tell Dave and Trevor are incredibly comfortable together. They'd been playing together in, in the uh, Don Rendell, Ian Carr quintet quite a while by that point. And then Dave's about to join Humphrey Littleton. And you can see they're very, very comfortable. And I was far more tentative. But then you think, well, they they played together for years. They'd never played, they'd never even heard Ivor playing before they got to the studio. They didn't rehearse, they improvised, mm. and they're away. So in 1964, I think it was, Ivor is an improv, you know, however briefly, an improvising jazz musician. It was for those three minutes, and then <laughs> he's off. And after that, he preferred, much preferred to be you know, a solo performer play, accompanying himself. Um, but I think that's indicative of, of Ivor's openness to things like that. You want to talk about, we were going to talk about Creamy Pumpkins because oh, yeah, yeah. we felt it uh, had a lot of a lot in common with um, some themes from Larkin uh, as we started to look at it more. So we were, uh, yeah, we were talking about uh, Essential Beauty by Philip Larkin, as I mentioned earlier, as a, as a mm. poem that can be seen as a, a, a quite surreal poem where you've got um, pictures of custard over the top of a cemetery. You know, you've got these weird, like, juxtapositions. Mm. Um, you've got the armchairs aligned to the cats and everything about it. It's kind of mo the modern world is quite surreal in its manner. Um, but then through it all, at the end, um, all the people that live in this surreal world, Larkin focuses our attention on this, on what he calls the unfocused she, there's this kind of female character that that marks, kind of walks through the the park, um, and nobody can quite reach her. So it go, it starts from being quite visually surreal to becoming really quite strange and enigmatic mm. towards the end of this strong feminine energy that runs through it all. And I think um, Creamy Pumpkins has got that. A similar kind of narrative where you've got this very surreal landscape at the end it's the woman that is what we're searching for the, the feminine creamy pumpkins when the land tilts run north leave the family you are the important one the dreamer the world needs its dreamers heads like creamy pumpkins quiet skin eyes that swivel round like smoke like turquoise, like bulby grapes, seeing where others face an empty flat wall. The land tilted, and I ran south, for not only did the land tilt the other way, but no one tells me what to do. I ran through snakes in the mud, boiling heaps of string screaming like a million kettles, and reached a woman kneeling on a bush in her nighty, terrified. I leapt up beside her, but only for a moment, for she was beside herself, and there was no room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really, I, I love that because there's some beautiful images in there and, and the way he uses words like, you know, the heads like creamy pumpkins and mm. quiet skin, eyes that swivel round like smoke. And there's also sort of elements of you feel like there's perhaps a few sort of autobiographical elements as well. You know, the, the land tilted and I ran south, which is obviously what, what Ivor did. But then there's the, the kind of the very strange imagery about running through the, uh, the snakes in the mud, screaming like a million boiling kettles. And then this, this bit about finding the woman at the end, yeah. kneeling on a bush in a nighty. For what reason we're, we're not privy <laughs> to. But, uh... I love that line scene where others face an empty wall. That's kind of really a lovely metaphor for being a poet in my, yeah. in my eyes. Yeah. There's yeah. something quite philosophical in there, isn't there as well yeah. about, about the role of the poet. I think yeah. that's what, that's what the creamy pumpkin headed person is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting with Ivor as to how, how much is came out at three in the morning and that's the end of it and how much of it uh, don't, goes more deeper into into Ivor's thoughts and feelings and opinions and life, as you say, this idea of him going south. I can't remember when he wrote Creamy Pumpkins. Which, which book are you reading it from? It's, it's just the lyrics from, it's a track on, I think it's on Privilege. Privilege, yeah. So that's an 80s, 1980s album. 
Um, because he did start life performing life in a completely invented environment called E Hoop. Mm. Y apostrophe H U P. He created this island of E Hoop and claimed for quite a few years to have come from, from this island and to be um the island's leading poet. Well, it's uh, you know, the, the this idea that Ivor Cutler had emerged from this strange island with green rain and uh, <laughs> animals that only walked backwards and didn't have any legs and birds that had no wings, bodies or heads and only had only had their sound. Um, and he kept that up for quite a while. And that's very surreal. You can see kind of the goons in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, it came out. It was he was certainly inventing that world in the mid late 50s. Um, but then he dropped it pretty much by the, the late 60s and it never really reappeared again. But uh, a bleak musical philosopher, that's what he used to call him. Yeah. <laughs> um, OMP, uh, which he claimed was, was, a, was a, a title given by uh, the, the population of E-Hope. So it's, uh, it's like <laughs> a bleak musical philosopher. Um, and he created a whole, a whole world at that time. Um, I think that's probably a way of getting himself kick-started into the, the perf yeah. world of performance. Taking taking on a role. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, that makes me think about Larkin um, at uh, university taking on the role of Brunette Coleman. You know, the um, he was writing for a while as, as this female pseudonym. Oh, but right, he, yeah. he created a whole kind of world for her herself. Mm. Brunette sort of became a person in herself. Um, and uh, again... A lot of people don't really don't find much of a kind of literary value in perhaps her writings, these sort of schoolgirl novels, that kind of pastiche to schoolgirl novels. But it was a possibly a way for him to kickstart his imagination mm. and his, his journey into the imaginative world. Um, and he he tried to write. I think he was trying to write another novel as, as Brunette and then eventually it all kind of fizzled out. And he, and he never went back to the world of Brunette Coleman. So I do wonder if uh, Brunette Coleman is his hoop mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something to be, to be said for that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's like you say, it's a, just putting a different kind of jacket on and just yeah. trying try yeah. it out. And, and, and it's maybe a safer way to do it if you Definitely. give yourself a role. Mm. Um, you're, Brunette, you're less exposed, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, yeah, you're less exposed and you can try different... Because he wrote poetry and, and essays and he even started to write a, a, a sort of autobiographical piece as Brunette, you know, right, and right. he really he really explored it in quite a lot of detail. It was quite a lot yeah. of output very quickly and then he and then he kind of shrugged it off. So, yeah, so, really interesting. Hmm. Well, I was going to just um, as a kind of final note, I was going to ask you, what do you think is like Ivor's uh, legacy? You know, I know there's been there was the tribute album Return to Ihup, and there's been um, obviously your book, and th there is obviously an, an ongoing interest in in Ivor Cutler. Mm -hmm. um, so, where where do you think that might go? What do you think he's left us? How do you think he's changed the world? Those of us who love him, love him. I have got a wife and two grown sons who can't stand him. So, if you ask them how he's changed the world, probably say for the worse. Um, <laughs> I think he's. I mean, he said, if you know, if I'm a genius, I'm a genius in a very small way indeed. Um, if he changed the world, I suspect he's changed the world in a small way. But that's fine. You know, I think it was Rick Danko from the band, one of my favourite groups, said years ago, you, you, you grow up thinking you're going to change the world. And eventually you come to realise the best you can manage is to help the community. Mm. Um, and I think, I, you know, the community that, enjoy Ivor today is helped by him. Um, I, I mean, I listen to him a lot. I, I read him a bit less, but um, that's mostly because most of the stuff on print I've, I've, I've got on, on disc. Um, but I think he makes, he does make you look at the world differently. He makes you see things that you perhaps didn't realise were there, or he helps you put things in it that weren't in there. Um, and I think for me, it's just a constant reminder that uh, the world isn't really just there to carry on regardless. It is there. Mm. To, you can influence it. You can shift perspective. You can change people's minds. You can, you can alter what people go on to do in their lives mm. in ways that uh, you know, are not always foreseen yeah, by the, your youngest self. 
Um, and, and it's never too late. You know, I mean, Ivor Cutler, the performer, was in his late 30s when he made his first fairly tentative steps on, on record and radio. Ivor Cutler, the, the well-known, popular and, and quite famous performer, came another decade later. Yeah. Um, and I think his popularity, you know, he was still selling out Queen Elizabeth Hall um, in the year or so before he died. You know, his last concert performance, he's in his early 80s. Clearly, yes. clearly yeah. frail, clearly not yeah. particularly well, but still doing um, what, he, what he loved doing and still being appreciated by large audiences. So I think, you know, for me, it's the, the idea that there's a place for virtually everything, a place for art forms. Some, uh, every art form will find a home, whether it's an Ivor Cutler poem or it's a piece of improvised jazz or it's a King Oliver solo from 19, mm. whatever it is. There's space for all of it, um, which should give us some cause for optimism. Um, even that, you know, the rest of the time it doesn't feel like there's too much cause for optimism. But I think, you know, it's the people with heads like creamy pumpkins that might just uh, get us through whatever. Yeah. <laughs> or, hail or, at least, or at least make getting through worthwhile. Because, yeah, yes, yeah. People with heads like creamy pumpkins. People yeah. who realise that, that thin shoes tell us more about the world we live in than thick ones. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Which is the entirety yeah. of that first poem of Ivers I ever read. Yeah. Billy Billy Connolly said the world needs Ivor Cutler in order to think differently. And yeah. you know that it, yeah. that's a great example with shoes, isn't it? Yeah. Just you think about that or a fly in a sandwich or yeah. you know, whatever. And you, yeah. you just kind of it just puts it through a, a completely unique prism. Sometimes mm. and just very short little ideas, almost like a haiku type, you know, just an yeah. essence of an idea. Yeah. Uh, and it just makes you go, Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it yeah. makes you smile, and yeah. and it doesn't really have much more than that, but that's enough, mm. you know. That's enough, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much to Gavin and Bruce for taking us through these two very different 20th century lives. Bruce's biography of Ivor is a lovely read and the first full biography of Ivor Cutler to be published, so I really recommend it. All the details are in the show notes. This podcast was produced by me, Lynn Lockwood, and Gavin Hogg. The music was The Horns of the Morning by The Mechanicals Band. If you have any questions or ideas for future topics or guests, then please, as ever, do get in touch. of the morning are blowing are shining the meadow is wet with the coldest of dew the dawn reassembles with a clash of gold symbols the sky hangs its fans out the sun Hangs in the